This is Eddie Hope with Virginia Professional Wildlife Removal Services in Kent Store, Virginia, and you are listening to the world's number one pest control training podcast, the Pest Geek Podcast with Frank Hernandez. Pull out your hose and grab your can. We're about to integrate another Pest Geek Podcast. Hi, everybody. Frank Hernandez here, and welcome to the Pest Geek Podcast, bringing you the latest information on pests, products, and politics from today's leading industry sources to help you start, manage, and grow your pest control business. Hey, welcome back. Welcome back to another edition of the Pest Geek Podcast. I am Frank Hernandez, your Pest Geek, here discussing all things pests. We want to remind our audience to join in on the revolution. That's right. Join in on the conversation. Be part of the society. Pest Geek Podcast listeners group on Facebook. And we're on YouTube. We're on the web, pestgeekpodcast.com. Check out there the notes, everything that we put into the podcast. They're all on there. And now for today's topic. You're, you're at a conference? Yeah, I'm at the National Conference of Urban Entomology. That is so awesome. <laughs> yeah, I thought we might. I thought we might want to talk about that briefly too. Um, where where is it that you? Where is this at now? Is this in um, the Northeast? It's in Cary, North Carolina. Oh, North Carolina. Okay, I just drove through there. <laughs> I yeah, like, I know. <laughs> it seems like I drove through everywhere. I drove through half the United States. I did, I think, seventeen hundred miles in in four days. So. <sighs> Yeah, so my wife wanted a road trip. She she definitely doesn't want a road trip anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you you covered some serious ground. Yeah, we went. Uh, we we did. Uh, we went Miami and then Savannah, then Savannah uh, to Asheville, North Carolina. Okay. Asheville, North Carolina. We just made it into the 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 mountains and um, we did a train ride there for an, almost an entire day, half a day. And we cool. start, drove back all the way to uh, into Atlanta and spent overnight in Atlanta and then drove into Miami, got back around 10 o'clock at night on Saturday. So, wow. Yeah. It, you know, I, ne- I needed to unwind. And that was a really long drive to unwind. <laughs> but I hadn't done that in a wow. while. And now I, I know why. <laughs> So wow, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I'm definitely getting too old for those road trips. I told her next time we're just flying. <laughs> but but I wow. she she got to see why the Smoky Mountains were smoky. Um and they're beautiful. No, they are. They are. I I I did that uh many years ago. I was probably the last time I was in the Smoky Mountains that I actually went over there to enjoy them. I was probably like 22, 23. Maybe and and then I did it again probably when I was uh, back in uh, I think ninety in two thousand I, I I was back there and drove through them coming from Ohio mm-hmm. and that was the last time I've been out that far um, traveling uh, in car and I just don't uh, you know I just don't have what it takes anymore to drive uh, you know twenty hours straight. <laughs> I hear you. So, I hear you. Yeah, it was it seemed easy in my early twenties. Now not so much. Yeah, no, I, I I forgot about how you know how old I've gotten. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to forget. It's, it's, it's yeah. frustrating sometimes. Yeah, I, I my mind still thinks I'm twenty. My body says no, you're not close. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's incredibly inconvenient, don't you think? Yeah, <laughs> age. <laughs> <laughs> it's very inconvenient. Every everything that comes along with it. But uh, tell me, I, I'm I'm gonna what what is it that uh, I'm recording? So. Tell me what what you're doing in uh in 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 North Carolina at the convention. What's been going on there? So I'm at the 2018 National Conference on Urban Entomology, and this year it's also being held in in um, conjunction with the Invasive and Pest Ant Conference, which used to be the Fire Ant Conference. Okay. Um. So yeah, we probably got I don't know, I'm gonna guess is maybe 200 urban entomologists here. Oh. Um, so okay. it's a it's. You know, I guess you could call it an intimate group. Um, so it's a really, like, you know, smaller meetings like this, you have so much more time to visit with your colleagues and meet new people and right. um, really focus on, on the research that affects the, you know, the pest control industry. I mean, this is, this is what this meeting is almost exclusively about. Um, so it's a really fascinating one because you get to hear some of the basic research that usually blossoms into hopefully something that fits us for applied work. 
Um, but you also get to hear a lot of the applied work, especially like the, the new species that are coming out or that they're really starting to notice. Okay. Um, it's like the dark rover ants. So we had a really great talk about that today. Um, and there'll be lots of bed bug talks, of course, and ticks. So we're excited to hear about ticks. Okay. You know, they've been getting quite a bit of media and lots of ants, and there's even a resident section. Wow. And so what, what has been like the most interesting topic so far? But, um, it started last night with a reception. So today, so far, for me, it was the, it was the rover ant. Okay. Um, because people aren't really looking for it, and they don't realize. And it's like the size of um, several grains of salt. I mean, they're really, really tiny. Wow. Um, yeah, they're really small. And, and, and the, the student that gave that research, he found they were in every, every county of South Carolina. Um, and they believe that they're, they're definitely in North Carolina. So that he suspects that they're spread much more throughout basically all the South United States, um, more than anybody thought. So, uh, and it, what's fascinating about them is, is they like to be with other invasive, aggressive species. So they're happiest with Argentinians and red imported fire ants, which I was fascinated by. Yeah, yeah, no, that, yeah. that's very interesting. So we got this species that, yeah, it's going to adapt very easily anywhere it goes because it doesn't, uh, it's not very antagonistic. Um, yeah, I mean, in the fire ants, they said they actually do, you know, like antenna communication and move on. Wow! They don't even fight each other. Yeah, how crazy is that? No, that's a that's a, that's amazing. <laughs> so, so that was that was a good start to the to the day's meeting, and I'm looking forward to hearing some of the new bed bug talks, and especially the TikToks. That'll be that'll be really fun to hear because it's um kind of an upcoming area again. Ticks were forgotten about for a long time. Yeah, no, I I I, I don't have a lot of things with ticks down here in Florida. Hasn't been a big problem for us, um, at least not here in Miami. More fleas this year than anything, uh, but ticks hasn't been a, a big issue for us. Um, I guess maybe because we just get dog tick down here. That's pretty much all we have. So a lot of other places probably are dealing with uh, other types of tick, um, like deer tick and stuff. But here, yeah, it's just dog tick for us down here in Miami. We're really urban, so, you know, <laughs> not a lot of horses and yeah. stuff running around the... Uh, deer and horses running around the city, but I can I, but I could imagine that would be a, a horrid thing, you know, in other places of the country where where there is. I just saw a lot of cows, oh. yeah, and, and started observing cows as they were laying down sleeping in pastures, um, you know, because Harry told me about how you know certain animals will sleep on one side, and the meat is a lot more tender uh, because so now I, everywhere I go I start observing cows. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and see how seeing seeing how many were flipped on one side and how many were flipped on the other. Hey, you know he's right. <laughs> the stuff I, I I was able to observe for miles <laughs> as I drove through the country. <laughs> the things we learned from home. Yeah, no, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, he just made a post a few minutes ago uh, about you know forty something things that he deal, had to deal with after a barbecue competition, and one of them he figured out why vanity mirrors are in porta potties which that really the only thing I took away from that because, you know, that was about the most <laughs> curious thing out of all the things he said. So I'm, I'm waiting to hear the response of why we have vanity mirrors uh, in porta potties. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'm I might be afraid to know the answer. I, you know, I don't know, but I'm going to find out because, you know, uh, it's it's just a terrible piece of information to waste. I mean, you never know when that's going to come in handy if you're ever on the road. And, uh, you know, I go to a lot of construction sites, so I really need to know this. It's true. It's true. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll, I'll have to look for that. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll wait for his answer on it. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, he, he won third place on, on ribs. And like, you know, he's really bumming out because he got like 20 something on out of 43 on another. His beans were not very good. So he's he's bummed out about his beans. And uh, so, Aww. yeah, so we'll, we'll we'll have to get him a, I don't know, maybe get him a bottle of canned beans or something and send it to him. Maybe he'll feel better. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that'll help. Uh, you know, so we're trying to figure this one out, but I'm trying to help the guy out. You know, he's pretty bummed out. I mean, you know. Yeah. You know, he, 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 he's, he's complaining he's breaking even on all these competitions of the money he spends, plus whatever he makes, it he breaks even. So I don't know. I think he just goes for the abuse. I'm just trying to figure it, it out for him i'm trying to help the brother out but you know we'll, we'll, we'll find out 
be a nice somebody traveling hot can be, you know, thing just to see what happens. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna send him a copy of this podcast after we're done, and you know, <laughs> I, I think he's probably still soaking. So I'll just wait wait I'll wait a couple of days and let him let him deal with it and <laughs> you know. The next car he gets is on borates and he'll be over it, so that'll that'll be fine. So what's going on with bees? Tell me about bees. I mean, hey, you, what's been going on with pollinators? Well, you know, it's interesting. I um, I have I have a, a a pest control association because I you know I go around the country teaching CEUs. Right. Um, and Canada asked me to go up there in Alberta and speak about bees and wasps and um, and pollinators. Okay. And pesticide effects. And so, you know, I, I mean, I have to say, I was kind of um, ignorant on the topic, I guess you could say. You know, I just never really paid a whole lot of attention. You hear the whole, oh, it's, you know, it's the fault of pesticides. And I, right. you know, being a scientist, I'm like, yeah, I'm not sure it's always that. But I never really looked into it. Right. I, I was floored by the amount of information and how complicated the whole thing is. It's, it's not crystal clear at all and it's a shame because there's really no one out there talking about the big picture you know and as in our industry i think it's important for us to to be able to you know more or less defend ourselves or at least have a better understanding of it um yeah, i mean it's it's not to say there's definitely um there's definitely something going on with the bees and i mean i'm certainly i'm pro pesticide i'm not going to say that um it's pesticide fault but it's they're not crystal clear on it right but what was fascinating was how incredibly complicated it was and the only thing that really shocked me was i found data um where they they showed like the number of bees um in surveys that were collected and the surveys for the longest time just occurred like in the middle of the summer and then all of a sudden they started collecting data like in the winter or in the spring or in the fall. Right. Um, and a lot of times that coincided with um, the bee colonies being split up. So, you know, they'll take one big colony and they'll split it into two and they'll put a new queen with the, with the split colony. So when you do that, you know, when you only select your data in the, in the population numbers for the summer, they seem fairly consistent. And, you know, there's always going to be some issues, but, but fairly consistent from year to year. Well, when they suddenly started taking the data at other times of the year, especially after they split these colonies, suddenly there's these massive drop in population. Hmm. Well, a lot of it has to do with it's a weak queen. And it has nothing to do with anything else. It's just the fact that they just split the colony and that split colony didn't make it. Hmm. Yeah, so I was like, that's a huge huge deal um you know when you look at the big picture of oh look how much you know how much the, how big the populations have been decreasing and you look at the data and you go well that's only because we have more information about what happens in the winter gotcha okay yeah because i saw it's, that years ago um i think i did a, a, a podcast on that a couple of years back it's been a long while probably one of my first ones and i i noticed that the whole issue you know with especially migrating colonies uh, where they're moving them yeah. and they're moving them back and then they're in the they're in the summer in one place and they're in the winter in the other and I know mm -hmm. that that what they started monitoring that and they started getting some of that data too um, we, mm -hmm. ju we just kept thinking it was I you know everybody's blaming the neonicotinoids because they are you know these these rented co you know what people don't understand about bees uh, when we think about bees we just think about the honey you know from the general public you know they're thinking about mm -hmm. honey they're thinking they're thinking these bees are stationaries a lot of the bees that people don't understand is that these bees are are being migrated to be used in farms for pollinating and then being transported back somewhere else, sometimes yeah. thousands of miles, putting them under an extreme amount of stress. And so, yeah, so, and that's another big contributor. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So that that's been you know. So people don't really understand that it's not bees that these things aren't stationary. And then you have a farmer that you're renting these bees out to and he's spraying the fields and yeah. you know and he's killing the colonies that you're renting to them and and then people don't mm -hmm. understand this that, that, that it's not just a stationary farm that all of a sudden this guy's bees started dying because he has a farm and he has this you know 
honey farm and wax farm and we think of this book concept of, of what a bee farm is and we don't understand that the majority of bees that are dying are actually being rented out or used in in crop production and then coming back and you know collapsing and and, and you know that's what they, that's what they're not knowing or they're not being told um so so yeah so so that that's the biggest you know uh you know like i said it, it, headlines are awesome except you know they don't tell you the whole story <laughs> no and 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 you're exactly right and that was a big part of it too it's just that that colony exhaustion is kind of what i ended up calling it and then there's also the fact that if they have a car accident with those colonies those colonies are gone what what was that you again know, I, 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 I i i i didn't hear that last part what was that again so if they if you know they're transporting these these colonies with trucks right, right. yes if the truck has an accident that colony's gone yes those colonies don't normally make it through through if the truck falls over or, or there's an accident or things like that. Usually those colonies are gone. So you lose colonies just based on on the difficulty of transporting them. Period. Never mind the heat in the truck and like right. I said, just the fatigue of moving them all the way up and down the east coast or across the country so they can pollinate almonds or all those things feed into it. And yeah, again, nobody talks about it. And there's you know. There's fewer beekeepers doing that kind of work, so they've got fewer bees to do all of the work. Right. Yeah. Let me. Um, let me. And that's a big part yeah, of it. Yeah. What it. What it. Because I know that the varroa mite is 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 a big contributor in colony collapse disorder. Um, the the bacterial mm -hmm. disease that they transmit uh, is another contributor. Any more research on that? You know, showing because that seems to me. At, at the time I did the studies back in, you know, a couple of years back, that that was the biggest contributor right now. And, and you know, the, the, the not, com, not, not treating those colonies correctly with the, with the, um, the, the antibiotics or the, or, or the antifungal to deal with the, the transmittal disease of those varroa mites and things like that. What have they been finding about those things? So there's there's a couple interesting things going on um, with that. Um, one being, um, you know, they're looking at why in some countries are are those pests not an issue um, for the for Apis mellifera, which is the you know, the Latin name mm -hmm. for the honeybee that we're talking about with the domesticated honeybee, um, or um, you know what. Uh, I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought I lost my um, connection. <laughs> Yes, no, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, so that, but that is one of them that, um, that you know, they, they were saying, why, why is some bees, some of these, you know, the same bee, same species, but in one country it's not as bad as another. Um, and they find that they believe, and what that led to was they, they started looking at, you know, if the bees had their choice, what would they pollinate? Well, they would rather have a giant field with um, irrigation um, ditches, with weeds growing in it um, and all that type of stuff, that would be more of a natural environment. Well, you know, because of IPM and trying to do pest prevention, you know, I mean, we're, we're kind of trained sanitation. So you get rid of the weeds and you keep the drenches, you know, the, the trenches dry and, and all those ir things, keep the irrigation down. And so that actually makes it, um, you know, that, that actually feeds into malnourishment of the bees. They do need some variety. They do need water. Um, you know, if there's droughts and things, and, and they, they need they need water. So all those things start to feed into it too. So then you've got they're just not as healthy, they're not thriving, and so they're more susceptible. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, so I mean, it's it's interesting how um, you know our practices in some ways feed into some of those things, and it's just like it's like this big circular thing of well, this causes this, and this causes that, and this right. just goes around and around. Yeah, and, and the other crazy thing um, uh, about it was um, with the with the um, oh, I've lost track of it again. Darn it! I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I, you know, I'm, I'm distracted by bit bug talk. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, and I've lost track of it, and I'm sorry. But there is something else about about that specifically with their health that I just can't seem to pull out of my brain. It'll come back to me, I'm sure. Um, you know, the other thing is that people say, oh, okay, okay, I do remember now, I'm sorry. Um, so as far as as far as far just the variety of foods go, you know how everyone's really into the, oh, have pollinator-friendly gardens. 
Well, what they found is that, you know, it's nice to have those, but that's not helping the bees really get the nourishment they need. That's not their, that's not their preferred place to go get their nourishment. So, um, in, it, it's nice and it doesn't hurt anything, but it's not exactly, it's not going to fix the problem. Now it's great for native bees and solitary bees. And these are huge um, proponents of pollination. They don't seem to kind of forget about those. Um, you know, bumblebees do a lot of pollinating work. In fact, they do something called sanitation, where they actually disengage their wing muscles and then they vibrate. Okay. And they do that so they can shake the pollen out of the flower. It's the only way to get the pollen out is through sonication. Okay. Isn't that cool? So mm. so they, they don't flap their wings, but they buzz, and it shakes the pollen out, and that's how they pollinate those flowers. So okay. a regular honeybee couldn't do that work. Um, that's a big component of the whole thing. Right. Um, you know, we're, we're not looking at all the other species that play a role in pollination as well. Right, right. Yeah, no. So, so the study that that or the the studies so, so that we understand that you're that they were discussed are are these more in the in the realm of um, honey 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 bee farms that are cultivating honey uh, or cultivating the the bees for rental or are they also studying what's happening with bees in the wild? Uh, is it two different studies or how is it broken down or because I mean, there's a big difference between something that you're also feeding artificially, you're feeding artificial nutrients to it, or sugars, and then you're mm -hmm. trying to farm this, and then something that is happening or naturally occurring in the wild. Are we seeing the 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 same things in in wild honeys, uh, wild bees that are you know, just have their colonies out there, or are we seeing the same thing in 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 colonies that are being you know farmed? Is what I'm saying. Yeah, so these are farm colonies because that would be okay. it would be it would be difficult to collect that kind of data as far as you know where they were where they were going. So this is definitely you know uh, they weren't wild populations that they were seeking out to collect it. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, that would be that, that I'm, it probably exists somewhere. I haven't uncovered that one specifically, but that would be that would be a lot harder to get that work done. Although it's definitely important. Um, but, you know, I mean, in, in the big scope of things, it, the other thing that I found really interesting, going back to the varroa mite and the, the mm -hmm. fungal disease and the zima, um, one of the things that they also found is that once one bee is infected and it goes to a flower and it pollinates it, some of that disease or the mite stay behind on the flower and it can cross infect the next pollinator. Ah, Okay. Yeah, so so it's another one of those things to go. Oh well, you know, once you hear it, you go, oh well, that makes sense. But you don't really think about. So that's another way that these are being spread. And so that's why they think it happens more in some countries than in other because you know it's being spread through the natural um, native populations and just being circled back to the honeybees. And so that's how they're sometimes getting infected. Um, so yeah, that's a whole other level and component of complexity of what's going on and why. So we're getting a lot of a lot more data that we didn't have just a couple of years ago on on what is actually going on with bees and and it just and and I and I said it you know I could be wrong but I said it back a couple of years back I said my my thing is it's not going to be neonicotinoids it is something else um, that's that's causing this and everybody is just easy to point out the neonicotinoid. Um, and, mm -hmm. and and ignore everything else and not have the site because we, we we looked at the data. There's just not enough data there until they put together. I forgot how many years ago it was that they put together this organization and the government just really took seriously the studying of the problem. So you know we started right. pointing the finger at you know hey it's it's the neonics let's ban them all over Europe. And then there's no serious data and now we're getting serious data and the preliminary data shows hey it's not the, the neonicotinoids necessarily it's something else and we right. don't and we don't know what that's something else and we still probably don't know till with all the data we have we're, i think we're just starting to scratch the surface so that yeah you know that people don't have this and let me ask you this was there any studies done i mean over here we've got the africanized uh, uh honeybee and we're suspecting that the majority of colonies now that in florida that they're finding are africanized um 
uh, and, and and even in, in different parts of the world, they're, they're actually starting now to take Africanized bee and just, you know, cultivating that for honey and everything else in farms. Are they finding that there's any difference between the two species uh, of bees uh, that are more susceptible or not? Or, or is it uh, any, any information on that? I did not see any information on that. Okay. Um, and now that you point that out, that's kind of interesting. I didn't, I didn't notice anything about that. I think that's because all the money is going into Apis mellifera. Um, you know, and even the, even the pesticide data that is being generated that shows, well, there's something going on, which interestingly enough about the neonicotinoids, um, you know, I mean, neonicotinoids come from nicotine, right, which right. comes from a plant. So these bees get naturally exposed to, you know, pyrethrum, to um, nicotine, on their own, and it was interesting. There was one study where it showed that the bees actually prefer the flowers that gave them nicotine, um, and it did affect their behavior. So, you know, I mean, you can say, well, logically, if it affects them from a direct flower, you know, hypothetically, the pesticide could too. So, you know, I mean, I'm not here to absolve pesticides right. completely, but it's just so complicated and yes. not just. It's not, yeah, thing. it's not. It's not a. It's not a simple cut decision and, and it's more complicated than and anybody and, and, the, and the more data that comes out the more complicated we realize how more complicated it is um mm -hmm, exactly yeah so I, I i am glad that that's happening and that you know that that we're able to put this out because people then can look at it and say well you know stop reading your headlines because it's not really helping mm. you to, to get into a frenzy when we when the scientists can't explain it and nobody really knows um yeah to 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 just point the finger at something and blame something or, or exonerate it yeah. in any way i mean that's just i think that's where we're at right now and uh, where we have mm -hmm. been and, uh, but you know again we, we the, the, you know i i keep having talk with scientists and it's funny how news media and marketers will you know overpower any real information that they're trying to get out because it's 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 you know you 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 you're you're ranking in Google and everything and the information is buried on page twenty five. Um, by the way, mm -hmm. do you, do you know where you bury a body? No, where do we bury a body? You bury it on the second page of Google. <laughs> no, nobody looks there. <laughs> You know what? I only go for the first ten, but I'm a little on TV, so. Yeah, so there you go. So that that's the uh, and very few very few people use Google Scholar. So I, I think more people need to use Google Scholar than, than regular Google when they're doing their research. Um, so yeah, because marketers will win. Uh, but you know, marketers, dang it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But no, but that's really cool. I mean, I, I'm glad that that's going on. And um, if by the way, if you talk to anybody interesting, you know, just a, a suggestion here uh, at, at these conferences, and they're willing to give you an interview uh, that you can send to me, that would be awesome. Do that. Yeah, I'm you can really record it on your phone. We're we're getting a bunch of correspondents right now doing that for us, and they're getting uh, uh, data, uh, you know, interviews in the field, you know, because because if you tell, see, the thing is, you're a really brave soul. I got to I got to admit this to you. Um, you've been back a second time. Um, I haven't had <laughs> I haven't had a single man come back a second time. Okay, so 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 I mean, you know, you were on that podcast. Are you crazy? You know. You know, so yeah, so I mean, I, you know, the the fact that you've taken your beatings and and still came back, and we're, we're willing to endure this a second time, it's just amazing. I, I mean, I, I I guess women can endure more pain than men can. I mean, my wife tells me that time, you you're just a wimp. You know, if you had to go through childbearing, uh, you know, you would know what real pain is. I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, thank God, God didn't wire me that way. <laughs> So, yeah, so women, it, it is official, being scientifically proven on this podcast that women can tolerate more pain than, than men. <laughs> so, yeah, well, hey, I really want to thank you. I know you're in the conference. When is your next class? What's, what's on the next class you're, you're headed to or going to listen to? Well, let's see. Let's see. Uh, I want to go to, I think I'll be there just in time. There is a talk from um, North Carolina, and they're going to look at histamine reactions with bed bugs and, and, and talk about whether or not there's a public health risk. Uh, yeah, uh, read that back to you, because I, I, I've heard something about it, but I, I lost you in a click there. Uh, what was the name of that disease that is transmitting? 
um, histamines, you know, allergens. Okay. When you have an allergy, right? And, and so you have an allergic reaction. It's histamines. Right. That, that, that's what it's about. It's about okay. whether or not bed bugs, um, you know, cause people to have a histamine reaction. Interesting. That, that would be very, yeah. that would be very cool to know. Yep. So I'm, I'm curious to hear, hear that one. And then the one after that is effects of color contrast on bed bug locomotion behavior out of Rutgers. Huh. So that ought to be interesting too. Yeah, I, 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 I get most of the stuff I get on bed bugs. I get from Rutgers. That's where I've learned most of it. Um, so. Oh yeah, Cheng Lu's a he's a powerhouse. Yeah, so it's 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 so it's really awesome. Um, no, thank you again for for being on the podcast. And like I said, if you got anything coming new that you want to talk about, you're always welcome. Uh, to come on board and, and talk about it and, and share what you've learned and what you're doing. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I will definitely, I'll, I'll snag a few people and, and uh, chat them up and send it your way. Sounds like a plan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. You too, Janet. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah. Oh, forgot to get your contact info. Oh, yeah, that would be good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, yeah I, I, I was like, oh, oh, my God, this is such a good interview. <laughs> And I'm just a lousy marketer. Um, yeah. yeah, so so Dr. Janet Kinserly and um, my website, my new website will be up soon, and it is um, jakconsultingservices.com. Um, and my phone number is 865-360-1988. And my email is Janet, J-A-N-E-T, at jakconsultingservices.com. And we do continuing education classes and um, help manufacturers get their products registered. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great one. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Well, we hope you've enjoyed today's edition of the Pesky Podcast. Have a pestacular day. Thank you for listening to the Pesky Podcast. If you have enjoyed the Pesky Podcast, please give us a rating, write a review, or subscribe to the channel. You can join the Pest Geek Society by visiting pestgeekpodcast.com. Thank you for listening. See you next time. <laughs>